Today our focus is on the Bible, food for thought. And that word, food, is key. Because the Bible contains references that liken it to food and drink. That, that seems quite odd, doesn't it? You know, saying that a book is like food and drink. Um, well, it seems odd, but this is what we're going to look into. First, by considering the importance of food and drink, real, you know, physical food and drink. And there'll be no great surprises there. And after this, we're going to see what God has to say about his word being like food and drink, and what impact this idea has on us. <coughs> now, like much Bible study, we're going to find that while maybe appearing a little strange at first glance, if we look deeper, if we chew it over, then there is a good reason for likening the Bible to food. Uh, let's begin then by just thinking about food and drink in general. Uh, we, we have food every day, don't we? Why? Well, because if we don't eat, then we can become malnourished and we can die. And it's not the action of the jaw, uh, eating, you know, going, the jaw going up and down, um, that keeps us alive. Otherwise, you know, I could just uh, stand here and talk forever, couldn't I? You know, jaw going up and down, here I am, I'm still going. No, it's, it, it's not that, is it? It's what's going on inside. The digestive process that pulls out the nutrients to regenerate and energise the cells in our bodies. Likewise, <coughs> drinking fluids is important. And it's something that we do several times a day. Why? Because if we don't drink, then we become dehydrated, which leads to sickness, faintness, and again, can even lead to death. And, and again, it's not the action of uh, drinking, tipping the glass or bottle back or the cup, um, that keeps us alive. It's what's happening inside. It's about rehydration, restoring lost fluids. Uh, here's a quick quote. For you from everydayhealth.com. Your body uses water in all its cells, organs and tissues to help regulate its temperature and maintain other bodily functions. Because your body loses water through breathing, sweating and digestion, it's important to rehydrate by drinking fluids and eating foods that contain water. <coughs> so drinking actually helps us to digest the food that we eat. The two work together. Uh, and this is what I want us just to take from this brief section. Eating and drinking are just ways of getting uh, that food and drink into our bodies to nourish and sustain us. If we want to live, then we must eat and drink. Now there are some caveats to that statement that we're going to go into later. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Now to end this section, let's just take our first reference from the Bible. Let's go to um, the first book of Samuel and chapter 14. First book of Samuel, chapter 14. Now, this is from the uh, early years of uh, Israel as an established uh, kingdom and in the time of their uh, king Saul. And uh, Saul had made an oath that uh, the people would not eat. They were in a time of war, and he makes an oath that the people should not eat um, until they have bested their enemies. And uh, his son, Jonathan, was uh, commanding some of the troops. And we read what happens with him here. Uh, so it's 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eats food, any food until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. And all they of the land came to a wood, and there was honey upon the ground. And when the people would come into the wood, behold, the honey dropped. But no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore, he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth. So he ate, ate the honey. And his eyes were enlightened. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Then said Jonathan, my father hath troubled the land, 
See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened, because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more, if happily, the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. For had there, had there not <coughs> now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. So, Jonathan ate honey, and his eyes became enlightened or, or bright. In other words, he just had a very useful kick of energy. And compared to the rest of the people, the rest of the troops who had not eaten, Jonathan was feeling alert once more. So just keep that detail in mind as we move on to looking at how God presents his word, the Bible, as food and drink. Now the original title I'd chosen for this talk was How to Eat a Bible and Live. Um, but I've shied away from that for health and safety purposes because uh, you, know, you never know if someone will try it. You know, if you pick up a Bible and start stuffing pages into your mouth, you cover uh, light on saturated facts, facts, yes, but I don't think it would do you much good overall. It's much better to just open it and read it, as, as we're going to find. The, the Bible makes it clear that God's words are spiritual food. Spiritual food that could be digested by thinking about them, uh, by thinking about these words. Let, let's see this in a couple of Psalms. Let's go, please, to Psalm... 19. It's the 19th Psalm. We'll read together from verse 7. Verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, <coughs> enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Did you notice verse 8 talks of the uh, commandment of the Lord enlightening the eyes. And, and in verse 10 it describes these commands as being sweeter than honey. Uh, remember the effect we've just seen, haven't we, that physically eating honey had upon Jonathan. It made his eyes bright. God's words have the same effect on us. That's what we find here. But, but what does that mean for us? We may be more alert, more aware, but how are we affected? Well, God's word can keep us on the right path, keeps us doing good things. So Psalm 119, so let's leap forward 100 Psalms to Psalm 119. Let's see what it has to say here. So this is Psalm 119, and we're going in at verse 97. So this psalm is broken up into sections, and we're going into the, we're just going to read the section that is uh, titled "Mem." So this is verse ninety-seven to verse one hundred and four. Ninety-seven. For how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies and my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep my precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Those last two verses there, those show us that God's words nourish our minds in a way that help, you know, helps keep us out of trouble. It's brain food, and it revives us. Uh, in verses 97 uh, and 99, um, you may have seen the word pop up, uh, the psalmist speaks of meditation. Meditation, that, that is to reflect upon something, to, to show devotion to it. Um, when you're devoted to someone, or to something, you, you think about that individual or, or that thing um, a lot. You 
you're going through a lot of uh, your mental time to thinking on those things. That's meditation, isn't it? And this is how we get the most out of God's word, when we think on it, when we study it. And there are lots of passages that make this uh, comparison of God's word being like food. Um, quite a few of the Proverbs liken honey to wisdom. So, we can't go to all of those passages by any means in the time we have, but suffice to say for now that the Bible, God's word, is indeed food for thought. Now, I said earlier, when we were thinking about physical food, that if we want to live, then we must eat and drink. I said, didn't I, that there are some caveats to that statement, and that's what we're going to consider now. Because uh, in the same way that we can say that about physical food, uh, there are also spiritual applications. So there's three, three caveats I want to make, uh, mention. Caveat number one, food poisoning and hazardous liquids. But we know, don't we, that too much alcohol is a bad thing. Uh, as for, well, poisoning, household cleaning products. When I was very little, I tried eating the imperial leather soap in the bathroom, and uh, didn't taste very nice. And it's a good thing I didn't go for any of the uh, bathroom spray. Because these are hazardous items, if we ingest them. Likewise, if food is undercooked or rotten with bacteria, then that can poison us. That's not a good thing. So consider this at a spiritual level. We have to ask, you know, has our spiritual food been tampered with? This is why Christadelphians stick to the Bible. This is why we stick to Genesis, to Revelation. We, we find that we can't trust um, other works, doctrines, or individuals that have come later claiming to be inspired, and yet if those inspired writings actually contradict the fundamental truths given in the Bible, then we know there's been some tampering that's gone on. In, in other words, we treat those things like we would uh, some coleslaw that tastes a bit fizzy. We, uh, we spit it out so that we don't digest it. We, we throw it away. So that's caveat number one. Caveat number two, hunger and thirst. I said that if we want to live, then we must eat and drink. <clears throat> but the second caveat is, of course, a harsh fact that sometimes people do not have that luxury and can be in a desperate situation of famine or lacking access to clean water. It actually puts me in mind of a passage from Matthew 25. We're going to come to this passage twice today. Uh, let's go there now. Matthew 25. Christ, he's speaking about the time when he has returned to the earth and, uh, to, and at the establishment of the kingdom. And we see, uh, let's see, verse 30, verse 34, explains the situation that's going to arise uh, in terms of judgment. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was, I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous say, answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered, and fed thee, or, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. We often read this passage as having a practical application, and we should, we really should, giving food and drink to those who need it. But we've learned too that there is spiritual food and drink. Now sometimes people, while being physically fine, and having an abundance uh, to get through, <coughs> are actually spiritually hungry and thirsting for the Word of God. So we should share this spiritual meal with them. So too, it says in Proverbs uh, 27 and verse 7, One who is full, yeah, fuller, loathes honey, 
but to one who is hungry, everything bitter is sweet. That really emphasises, doesn't it, how hunger can affect our attitude. If we're desperate enough, then we will appreciate anything that we can get. And curiously, this takes us to the final caveat. Um, the third and final caveat to the statement, we must eat and drink, is that, yes, that's a true statement, but occasionally we have reason to deliberately avoid food and drink. In other words, to fast. Some people will fast for medical or dietary purposes. A, a number of people fast for religious reasons. Now, fasting is a, a method of focusing the mind on God's word, and, and clearly there has to be a balance to it. We've seen, haven't we, how Jonathan benefited <coughs> from eating honey while his companions remained hungry, although it's worth noting that in the context of the situation, the, they're in a time of war, they needed to be alert, really, um, and they had been journeying hard. They were not in a, a relaxed state where fasting could be beneficial. They needed energy. Now, I, I had a housemate who fasts from time to time, and he finds that it does help him think about certain portions of the Bible. Sometimes, as a result of being hungry, passages like the ones we've seen <coughs> come into his mind. Now, what is the spiritual applica application here? You know, should we fast from the Word of God, as in not reading the Bible and not thinking about it day by day? Well, well no. As, as far as I can find, um, and I'd be amazed if you could tell me otherwise, there's no advice in the Bible that recommends fasting from the Word of God. Oh, no clumsily put it like this. Uh, the point of fasting from physical food is to help aid digestion of spiritual food. It doesn't work the other way around. Fasting from spiritual food does not help our digestion of physical food or, or of uh, anything else besides. So, those are just those three caveats that I wanted to mention. And I hope you now see that there is the spiritual side of those. That last part, though, about fasting, that actually takes us into the next part of our talk. Uh, because Jesus himself fasted. The Bible tells us that he went into the wilderness. He fasted for 40 days and nights. And, and we see there's the, the conflict in his mind between temptation to, to satisfy his own desires, and yet there's also a yearning to follow the words of God, his Father. The most immediate temptation was to deal with Hunger. Let's have a look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2. And when Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, he says, It is written. Where was this written? Well, we find it right back in Deuteronomy. We find it from the time when God had brought his chosen people, the Israelites, out of captivity in Egypt. And they were travelling through the wilderness to the promised land. And, and they too, because they were travelling through this wilderness, they were hungry for a time. And they were hungry because they had to learn this same lesson. Let's have a look at that. Let's see where it is written. Uh, it's Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's important that we go into the Old Testament and we'll see why in a moment. So Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's from the start of the chapter, it's just the first three verses. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, 
neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So there it is, that's where it was written. And there's some fascinating parallels there. We've got 40 years, the Lord Jesus, he spent 40 days and nights being tested in the same way, in, in a wilderness place. Now, throughout his period of tempting, the Lord Jesus, he, he used the word of God. He used his spiritual food that he'd been digesting again and again to follow God's way and to deny his physical temptations and his, uh, what he was wanting. He had nourished his mind on that word. He was using it in the right way. So he says, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Basically, I'm not going to serve myself. Serve the Lord God. Now we've seen how the Lord Jesus Christ, he used the word of God from the Old Testament, the words of his Father, as a means of resisting temptation. And remember the psalm that said that the commands of God keep us from straying into evil ways that go away from God. Well, we therefore should follow the example that Jesus has set for us. How, how do we go about this? What is our spiritual diet plan? Well, it's very simple. It needs to be, as so many scientists tell us these days, it needs to be a regular, balanced diet. We'll break it into those two parts. First, God's word has to be something that we take in regularly, something that we digest frequently. Uh, you may recall the Lord's Prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Do you have a big dinner on a Sunday afternoon and then don't eat again until the following Sunday? Well, no, in the, in the day to day course of things, you, you have meals practically every day. Is God's word to be treated any differently? Make the Bible part of your regular intake. It also needs to be a balanced diet. That's the other part, isn't it? A balanced diet. As humans, we love to uh, have choice. We love to cherry pick the parts that we want and to ignore those things that uh, you know we don't really like the look of. If, if I went into a supermarket um, and had free choice and had some unlimited funds and unlimited freezer space, you'd find the ice cream aisle very empty very quickly, while the veg aisle would be you know, bursting with produce. Now, I do like vegetables, but they don't come with as much uh, caramel or chocolate. Um, do you see the problem with that? There is a problem, isn't there? Um, all ice cream and no veg would make me a very sick boy. We understand that, don't we? That our diet must be balanced. And it's the same with the Word of God. We can't ignore revelation because it's full of pictures that hurt our brains to understand them. We can't just pull out the New Testament, just this bit, and discard the Old Testament, you know, because it appears a bit far in brimstone. The Old Testament is absolutely vital to understanding the New Testament. And it's, of course, the Old Testament portions of Scripture that Jesus used to resist temptation after temptation. If we focus too much on one book, if we don't give enough thought to another, then this can lead us to having imbalanced views and to having a really poor understanding of God's word. So, you see then, it needs to be that regular, balanced diet. There's something else I should mention. Uh, the Bible, to look at it, is a heavy meal. There's a lot, a lot there to digest. And we can't hope to digest it all in the lifetime that we have allotted. It can appear a daunting task to begin with. But the Bible gives advice on how to handle it. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11. So, the writer says, of whom we have many things to say 
and hard to be able to seem the dull of hearing. He's speaking to, uh, to leaders. He says, For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. Every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, but he is a babe. But strong things belong to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So that can be a, a little hard to, uh, to get to the bottom of there, uh, especially leaping into the chapter halfway through, but what it's really saying is that you have to start with the basic principles. You, you're like a baby, starting with milk. Um, you can't feed a baby a steak, can you? It's... Um, they have to start with milk until that time when they've matured and developed the ability to digest solid foods. So that's how we start with scripture. We look at the simple first principles and build from there. Now, with the Bible out, it's important we talk about the kingdom of God. In the Bible, God states his firm intention to set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. And Jesus, who resisted all temptation, he did not sin. He was raised to life after he was crucified. And this is what gives us hope of resurrection through the baptism that we've undergone. As a means of associating ourselves with his death and resurrection. Moreover, the Bible shows us, in fact, it's in, we've been there already, Matthew 25. The Bible shows us that Jesus will be the king of that kingdom. So let's go, here's our penultimate uh, reference. Matthew 25. We're just going to go in a little earlier than where we were um, last time. So, chapter 25 and verse 31. So again, he's, he's describing this time. He says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep. From the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, I'm sure that the kingdom of God will be spoken of in more depth on other occasions, uh, but it's time, time for us to conclude. We saw how physical food and drink has a positive impact on our bodies and our minds. It, it's not about the action of eating or drinking that helps us live. It's about that process going on inside. It's about the digestion, the rehydration. In the same way, we found that, uh, found that God's word is like food. We can read it, but are we digesting it and getting the benefit? God's word is something that we should be thinking about on a regular basis. And that diet, it needs to be balanced, ensuring that we take from all of the Bible and not just the parts we like. So the Bible is indeed food for thought, and I want to leave you with some food to think on. In John chapter 1, we find Jesus described as the Word of God made flesh. In other words, he represented or embodied the commands of God by following his Father's commands perfectly. We've seen that to digest spiritual food and to renew our minds, we think about the Word of God. So we need to think about Jesus, the Word of God made flesh. Throughout John chapter 6, that we had as our reading, the Lord Jesus Christ, he actively encourages this idea that the Word of God and he himself are like food. Interesting, isn't it? Well, study John chapter 6 later on, chew it over, um, well, actually, let's just turn there for a moment, because that's our final reading, John chapter 6. Um, but this is the homework. Look at it later on, perhaps while uh, you've got the Sunday dinner cooking. Um, chew it over, think about it, um, and see what you find. But we'll just take these few <coughs> verses from this chapter to finish. So John chapter 6, and verse 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, 
let ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe him? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. And so then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Thank you for listening.